book, A Tale of Two Cities, more of that in a moment. The second is I realized I need reading glasses. <laughs> so um, forgive me. Um, but some of you will know this book. He begins it with a very famous opening line. He says this. What do you reckon? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, he says, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And he wrote that in 1859. And he was commenting on the cultural moment that he found himself and his peers living in, in early Victorian Britain, and commenting really on the malaise, the kind of sense in which we don't really know who we are and we're a bit lost and confused. And as I read that, I thought, you know what, he could be writing that about 2024. We find ourselves, don't we, living in a cultural moment, I would suggest, where we're experiencing the best of times and the worst of times. This moment we're in is a paradoxical one. There's these things that are competing truths that are in tension with one another. On the one hand, there are these incredible opportunities that open up before us. My son is telling me all about the advance of artificial intelligence and how it can basically save me 80% of time on all sorts of tasks. And at the same time, there are some really difficult challenges that we're having to face up to individually and collectively. More and more commentators, both within and beyond the church, you'll have heard me say this before, are arguing that we're actually in the early stages of a move from one cultural era to another. And they take decades to happen, and we don't quite know where we are in that. But increasingly, that is the common view. So let me nerd out just for a moment. Some of you will love this. Some of you will just be like, tune out for a few minutes, and I'll get you back. Um, Oz Guinness, who some of you will have heard of, he's the great-grandson of the Guinness founders. He's 82 now. He's a philosopher and theologian based in America. He describes our moment as a civilizational moment, and he says this. The world is fast approaching one of the great turning points in history. After half a millennium of unprecedented dominance, Western civilization is on the wane, and the shadows it casts are lengthening. What I'm trying to do is give you the big, 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 big picture of this moment we find ourselves in, because most of the time we're dealing with the reality on the ground, the symptoms of it, but to understand these times, we sometimes have to get the big picture perspective. We are in a time of civilizational decline in the West, and the sooner we pay attention to that, the better, for two reasons. One, it helps make sense of it, but more importantly, it helps us as the people of God pay attention to what the call of God is on us in and for these times. Uh, someone I know who's based in Australia, a guy called Mark Sayers, he puts it like this. He says, Western culture is a failing secularized revival, entering a moment of doubt. Secular revivalism fails because it wants progress without his presence. It wants the kingdom without the king. In other words, he says, the secular project is an attempt to do life as we want it, but without God. And essentially, you can't do it. And essentially, he wrote this about six, seven years ago. He would now say, we are in that moment of doubt, he talks about. People have realized it doesn't work. Hence, we are now increasingly post-secular. Os Guinness goes on to say this, and this is really important. I'll explain what he means in a moment. He says, while the West faces strong and implacable enemies from the outside, its most vehement and radical enemies are within the waning of the West, he says, is due in part to a Western war on the West. For the animating spirit of much of the West today is passionately adversarial to what it has stood for historically. In other words, like in English, what he means is we are tearing down the very foundations on which our culture has been built on. And then we wonder why it's all going horribly wrong. Now, you may not agree with me, but I think that makes complete sense of what we're experiencing. One of the symptoms of this is, of course, increasing resistance and opposition to Christianity in our culture. There's many others, but it helps explain that piece. And if I'm honest, one of the things that I find so heartbreaking and difficult is that we see this playing itself out within the church as well. And so we see symptoms of that in division 
and decline. And why I rejoice on the exodus from our building at about 25 past 10 of all those under 18 year olds. We are bucking the trend and we will continue to do all we can to get behind that generation. What I'm trying to say, come back if you, nerded, uh, if you missed the nerd out moment, is that we are living in this moment in history that actually is really significant. And God's people have always been called to inhabit those moments on the front foot with an intentionality and a purpose and a confidence unto what God is wanting to do. People change in crisis. Cultures change in crisis. And God never wastes a crisis. So many people tell me their faith story began when something went wrong. We were at a retreat recently, Kath and I, uh, with a whole lot of church leader types. It was great. It was at Centre Parks, which included some time off. So we went on the rapids and the, the, the water slides with all our friends. It was insanely fun. But one of the people that was speaking to us was a guy called Rick Warren. Some of you will have heard of him. And he says, after 45 years of trying to work out how do we help people discover Jesus, he says, I've worked it out. He said, it's four words. You move, sorry, it's not four words. I think, yeah, it was four words he used. Move towards the pain. Church, how we reach people, how we help people find God is we move towards the pain. There's pain everywhere. And so move towards the pain. This is not a moment, in other words, for the people of God to hold back or to step back and to wait, and to watch, and to wonder, because we ourselves are caught up in all of this, and it's hard, and because we're a bit afraid, and we don't want to look stupid, and we don't want to face social death by declaring that we follow Jesus. Actually, this is the moment, I would argue, where we are called to step up, and to step in, and to do so in a way that is potent, and wonderful, and life-giving to the world. We must not become distracted or discouraged, or defined by this moment. The people of God, we're defined by something that happened 2,000-ish years ago, a moment when Jesus died on a cross and was raised to new life, and a moment that is still to come when he returns in glory to complete that which he began in that life, death, and resurrection. And we are the in-betweeners, in between that moment and that moment, and we are called to live in this moment with that in mind. Do you get what I'm trying to say? It's not a moment to hold back. It's a moment to step up and to step in. But what I want to do in this teaching series is say how we do that in this new season is really important. And it won't be in the way that we perhaps have historically gone about doing it. The church right now feels weak. But actually, we know paradoxically that when the church, the people of God feel weak, God is at his strongest. It's in our weakness that his strength is made perfect. And I want to suggest to you that the call of God is for us to be a holy, healthy, and humble church. One that's more interested in posture and practices, a way of being than lots of doing. People don't need more projects and programs, conferences, workshops, seminars, songs, books. They have their place. What the world needs is a church that's holy and healthy and humble and is sent then by God to be that kind of people in and for the world. There are lots of places we could go in the scriptures to see this taught and unpacked. We could look at the life of Daniel, for example. We could look at the life of Esther or Ruth or Mary. We could go to all sorts of places. One of the places that's helpful, I think, is the the first epistle of Peter, one of the early apostles in the church. And I've asked Kate if she would come and read a section of that. So while Kate comes, I wonder if you would find your Bibles And if you haven't got one, we can give you one, or you can just listen. It'll be on the screen. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 as Kate reads this portion of Scripture for us. So I'm reading from 1 Peter 2, verse 11 to 25. Living godly lives in a pagan society. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles... 
to abstain from sinful desires, which war, wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not cover up your freedom. Do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it, is, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So uh, keep that open in front of you. It's um, a text which I think, as you'll see in a moment, we see these themes of holy and healthy and humble woven through in particular ways. And we're going to unpack those three ideas over the next few weeks. But Peter's important, I think, in these days for us. One uh, theologian, a guy called Martin Hengel, describes him as the underestimated apostle. We've been quite interested, haven't we, over the last 20 years in how does the church rediscover that it's this missional people? And the apostle Paul has really helped us rediscover that. But meanwhile, Peter, quietly, he's been there just going, hey, but how you do it really matters. Holy, healthy, humble, that's just my language. His is a voice we need to hear more than ever. And he writes this to a church that was in a very, very similar moment to the one we find ourselves in, where there was cultural crisis going on all around them, where they were the minority, where they were under persecution and facing opposition. And he wrote this to encourage them and to cast vision to them for how you inhabit this moment in such a way that you are distinctly different from, but also in the world. Not a withdrawal exercise, but an incarnational, be in the midst of it, but be so different that something that God wants to do can happen through you. And notice the language he uses and the heart of the apostle. I always imagine when he's writing this, I kind of hear him as a sort of like grandfather Peter. Like, oh, he says this, dear friends, that can be better translated beloved, dearly beloved. It's because he loves us that he's saying this. I urge you. This isn't like a suggestion. It really matters. He's just described in the section before, if you know that letter, where who we are. We are, he says, the living temple, the presence carriers of God in the world. And he says, given that, I urge you to live such good lives that... This really matters. And he describes us, notice, as aliens and strangers. Not strange, although some people think we're strange, but in other words, people who don't really belong here. People who find themselves temporarily resident on earth in this cultural moment, but whose citizenship is now in heaven the heavenly realms, the kingdom of God. That's where we live from, into this world, he says. You're not meant to feel like you fit. We're meant to feel at odds 
at times with this moment we're in because we represent a different king and a different kingdom and a different culture. And the task is to bear witness to it, to to live it out in such a way, he says, that people see it. And it's one that's marked by those three things, holy, healthy, humble. He's urging us as the people of God to live freely in and for the world. We have this freedom in Christ that we're to outwork in a particular way so that in the face of opposition and suffering, challenge, ridicule, actually God ultimately gets glorified. And Peter says here, we find ourselves vindicated. Because one day people will be like, oh, I see. I see what you were trying to show us. I see who you were trying to reveal. In other words, he's saying, hold your nerve. Don't don't dial it down in these moments. Be true to who you are. And in his excellent commentary on this, a theologian called Peter Davids summarizes it like this, and I found this so, so helpful. He says, Peter calls us to uncompromising living as members of God's people, but notice the caveat. Let's wait for the ambulance to go past. In a way that reduces tensions to a minimum. Because the kingdom of God is in conflict, ultimately, with the kingdom of this world. And you and I are called to live on behalf of the kingdom of God in the midst of it, in such a way that actually God is glorified, but not in such a way that we add to that conflict. And let's be honest. The church, at its worst, is really good at winding people up. Have you noticed like one of the reasons that people don't want to engage with the questions of faith is because Christians are really annoying and miserable and fill in the blanks. We just need to own that. But actually, Peter would be like, no, no, no. You're meant to be like this people who are, what is it about them? Ooh, holy, healthy, and humble. Notice three instructions that Peter gives us. The first, in verse 11, we are to abstain from sinful desires which war against our soul. This, again, is not like, you know, you might just want to think about being a little bit more moral than everybody else. This is Peter going, guys, you're in a spiritual battle. There is a war against your soul. Everyone's in that battle. But we know Jesus who has fought that battle for us and is victorious. And what Peter says is, here's how you engage with that. You abstain from sinful desires. Those parts of us that are drawn to things, waves of seeing, talking, behaving, acting, that deny something of the holiness of God in us and therefore deny us something of the true freedom of being human. And the language is not like just dial, you know, just all things in moderation. No, he's like, abstain. The word here is actually distance yourselves. Put distance between you and those things that rob you of your humanity and God's glory in you. Elsewhere in the scriptures, we're told, aren't we, to flee those things. This is not like, you know, just it's an intentional separating out. To be holy is to separate yourself from that which defiles you. God is separate from that. He is holy, and he says to us, be holy as I am holy. And this is not about just like, you know, some metaphorical halo. <laughs> I'm, look how holy I am. It's like, no, no, to be truly holy is to be truly whole and different and gloriously fully alive in God, free. Free to love, free to serve, free to give, free to care in and through which God gets to be revealed. That's what true holiness is. It's more than just denying certain things, not doing things and being morally clean. It's a much more compelling vision here. Now that phrase sinful desires is actually better translated the desires of the flesh. And he's not talking just about physical desires. The flesh is biblical shorthand for the old self, that part of you without God in the mix. You know that instinct you have to have that extra piece of cake or to just share that little bit of gossip. Those are the flesh. 
And we're told to, you know, to, to die to that. To put on the new and live in that. But this is linked to uh, what else we're meant to do. This is not just be holy so that we can be holy. This is so that actually God can be revealed through us. So yes, it's for God that he's worshipped and glorified through our lives. Yes, it's for us that we're free. But it's also for the world. So he goes on to say, in the same sentence in the original text, the second thing. We are to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse us of doing wrong, they may see our good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, the day he visits us is unknown, even to Jesus, but that is the day when, as I said earlier, he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. And we are to live such good lives among the pagans. Now, pagans here is not like, you know, weird witch people. It's biblical shorthand for those who are not, do not believe in God. Pretty much everybody else, essentially. And notice the language. We're to live such good lives among. This is not do really good things for people. That is part of it. But Peter's not saying here, hey, one of the ways that you show people who God is by doing lots of good things for them. Actually, what he's saying here is live such good lives among them that people see and wonder and eventually go, ah. And so actually, it's an expression, I would argue, of health, true health. In its fullest sense, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks' time, emotional, spiritual, physical, relational, all of those things, true health is, a, is us being good as God intended. In fact, when God made you and I, his declaration not only was, was not only that we're good, but actually that we're very good. To be good is to be truly healthy, alive as God intended. And the judgment of God in Christ is that we are still very good and worth saving. Healthy Christians, and by extension healthy churches, are attractive. The inverse is also true. <laughs> so let's make sure we're healthy. And notice what he says here. People can take issue with what we believe, but when we live out our faith with integrity and consistency and in a way that is good, inherently good, it bears fruit. And it's really hard for people to argue with the outworking of our faith. I find it so much easier to talk to people about Jesus when they discover that we're the church that ultimately runs Worcester Food Bank. Because they're like, ah, oh, you don't just think it, you actually do it. And notice the expectation that Peter has here, that uh, people won't necessarily immediately glorify God. They will on the day he comes back, but they will see our good deeds. Wouldn't it be great for people to go, I've come to your church because there's something about you. Like, it's, you're good in a way that's attractive and compelling. That's the vision ultimately here for us. And when it comes to the church, it has all sorts of other implications, as I say, more in a couple of weeks' time. The third thing then we notice is verse 13, that we are to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. This is one expression, I would argue, of a humility. And again, there's so many aspects to that that we'll look at here. It's actually quite perplexing on first reading. What is he talking about here? But Peter's really clear, and this is the biblical perspective, is that human institutions, however flawed they are, and that they are flawed, are God-ordained, and that we're called to submit to their authority. And notice what Peter says here, for the Lord's sake. God outworks his purposes through citizens of heaven, becoming good citizens of whatever host culture they're in. Because and then through us, he can use us to bring change. If we're not good citizens, we can't be agents of change, essentially. And so we have to humble ourselves. Which is why I always say, please vote when the election comes up. Like Christians, it's incumbent upon us to lead the way. Now, there are, of course, biblical checks and balances on all of this. We're not to do this naively. And there are biblical kind of constraints on certain things where we would resist. But Peter's very clear. And notice... Uh, the, ver the verse 15, the clarity in verse 15 as to why this matters. He says this, It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. In other words, one of the ways you help people see who God is, 
is by living such good lives and being such good citizens. That's the will of God. And this sounds like quite derogatory language, doesn't it? Foolish people. But again, that's biblical shorthand for, for people who, who, who just can't see. And we use that language differently now. The point I'm making, I hope you've heard this, is that when you and I are holy and healthy and humble, for God, for us, for one another, we can also be a gift to the world. And in this cultural moment that we began with, the best of times and the worst of times, that's what the call of God is on the people of God. It's not what someone else on behalf of you is going to do. It's not what I'm going to do on behalf of you. It's what we together are going to do. But it's actually about who we are. And it's actually us learning to get our right place. God does the heavy lifting. God finds it a whole lot easier to reach the world through his people when we're not weird, strange, annoying, difficult, but when we're holy and healthy and humble. We know from history that God moves powerfully at precisely the moment that the church is at her weakest and the culture around us is in crisis. The chaos and the confusion and the pain that we see all around us are the perfect conditions for a new move of God. That's what I'm praying for. I really believe it's coming, but I think the Lord is wanting to do a deep work in the church first because there's a load of stuff that we've had to face up to and sort. We are not a healthy church collectively. We've tracked any of the situations of church leaders being taken out, investigations going on. It's very painful. But when you and I recognize that we're called to be this, what my friend John Tyson calls a creative minority, like a group of people who live differently in but for the world, God gets to do amazing things. This is the way of Jesus. It's always been the way of Jesus. The upside down, inside out, but right way round, kingdom of God and it is possible to do it and I'll tell you why it's possible to do it because Jesus has already done it you want to know what it looks like to be holy and healthy and humble you look to Jesus who we're told is the author and the perfecter of our faith But this author and perfecter says, here's what it means to follow me. It means to take up your cross. It means to die to yourselves. It means to deny yourself and live in him. He says, if you give up your life for me, you will find it. To be truly holy and healthy and humble, ultimately, is letting God do a deep work in us. It's not our good behavior. It's actually a complete transformation of the very essence of who we are at deep heart surgery and so the writer of the Hebrews says this he Jesus is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless unstained by sin he has been set apart holy from sinners you and I and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven Paul writes this in Philippians 2 he Jesus who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? And this is why Peter writes this at the end of the passage that Kate read so well. He says this, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, holy, and no deceit was found in his mouth, healthy. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats, humble. But instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly the Father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And then through us, God can be revealed. Are you up for that? (laughs) Think twice before you say that, because it's costly. But that's the call, isn't it? I don't know whether you know the story of a tale of two cities, but there's a killer final line as well. 
And he says this. And this is the story of um, Sidney Carton, who's like the main character, who basically ends up realizing he needs to lay down his life, a sacrificial death. And he says this. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. This is the invitation to the church. Always to be fully surrendered to God because that's where life is. But I'm saying in this moment, that's also what the church is needing to be for the sake of the world. Wouldn't it be wonderful to think that in a year's time there's twice the number of us because of how we've lived, people have been drawn into the life of God. It starts with you and I. I'm going to be saying all of this this week to the leaders gathering at the New Wine National Leadership Conference that Kath and I are leading. It's about 1,800 booked in. There'll be about 300 online. And I'm going to say to them that in the book that Simon Sinek wrote on leadership called Leaders Eat Last, he casts vision for leaders being people who serve everybody else. And I'm going to say to them, hey, do you know what? Leaders might eat last, as in they put themselves second to everybody else. But when it comes to this stuff, leaders have to kneel first. And what I want to say to you, All Saints Worcester, and I'll say more as we go, is we are called to lead by example. We're called to lead our culture in this moment. So we're all leaders for the kingdom of God. And so actually the way that you get to become holy and healthy and humble actually is to begin with humility. The way you get healthy and holy is through humility. We'll get there. But actually, the biggest moment is always when we get to our knees. We go, God. So should we kneel? You don't have to literally kneel, because that might be uncomfortable physically, but it's a posture of heart, of surrender, of submission, not so that God would love us, but because we've already been loved by the one who surrendered himself to death. Who in that moment in the garden, when Jesus could have taken matters into his own hands, humbles himself for us and says, not my will, but yours be done. You might find it helpful just to echo those words in your own hearts. Father, not my will, but yours. You might find it helpful to reflect on the example of Jesus. That, to see that this is a, a response of worship. If you can lay down your life for me, then surely I can lay down mine for you. I'm so mindful that on any given Sunday there are people here who are exploring faith. This is new to you and you're thinking, I have no idea really what you were talking about, Rich, but I sense something of an invitation of God. Let me reframe it entirely for you if that's you. God wants you to know who you really are and who he really is. And it's the way you get that is by just saying, God, here I am. <laughs> Reveal yourself to me. So Lord, I pray you'd forgive us for all those times where we failed to humble ourselves before you, to receive the freedom that comes from forgiveness and repentance through your grace. You forgive us for those times where we've not been a church that brings you glory, where we've been a church that has hindered people finding you, where we've been people who because of our own stuff often, just 
put people off you, not draw people to you. And in this season we find ourselves in, collectively and therefore as all saints Worcester, our heart would be that you'd call us to a deeper, more beautiful way. May we become more holy, more healthy, more humble, together and individually. We're going to sing a final song in a moment. And I'd love if you are here this morning and you think, oh, I really want to give myself to this. That perhaps God's been speaking to you already or through me today and you just think, I'd really want someone to pray for me. And it might be because there's stuff you know you need to deal with. It might be because you, your heart is pounding with the sense of the call to this. Sometimes we need the ministry of the Spirit, don't we, just to move us deeper into that. And if that's you, um, you're welcome to come and stand at the front and the prayer team will come and pray with you. So let's stand together, come and stand at the front or come and sit and kneel at the cross if you want to kneel yeah, a bit further. Um, let's stand together and as we sing, respond as you feel led. Mm-hmm.